Thank you all for being here. I am very happy to be here today and very grateful to the Climate Solutions Lab and in particular to Ali Baden who um, organized this talk today. Um, and thank you all for being here despite spring break um, very, you know, close, closely approaching. Uh, my name is Alice Plan. I'm a senior fellow here at the Watson Institute and I'm the former head of unit for climate change at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in France. Um, I'm honored and excited to be joined here by three wonderful guests. Uh, senior fellow Todd Stern. Um, he was the lead negotiator for uh, the USA when the Paris Agreement was adopted about 10 years ago. And um, among many other things, of course, but he will bring today the perspective of an American policymaker and one of the architects of the Paris Agreement. Uh, Professor Timmons Roberts, um, who teaches at IBES, some of you may have um, taken his classes, amazing classes, and he also works tirelessly to shed light on the disinformation and misplaced influence of the oil lobbies, including in here, um, American Academia. So he will bring um, the perspective of what I would frame as both an academic and an activist. And then uh, Priyanka Mahat, uh, she's a senior undergrad here. We met in my class on climate negotiations and practice last semester, and she came to COP28 with me. Um, but because she's this exceptional uh, human being, she managed to uh, jump on the bandwagon and um, get in touch with the Nepalese delegation out there and join the G77 plus China uh, negotiation group, which is in our COP jargon, an equivalent to the Global South. So she's bringing here today what I would frame as the perspective of both a youth and the Global South. Um, thank you all three for being here. I will um, leave the room now for Timmins to give us a brief introduction to why are we here, um, climate negotiations, what's going on, and why are they taking so long? Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Thanks, Ali. Um, Todd, very good to see you again. And Priyanka, a pleasure. Priyanka was in my lab group. I can't remember where we went. Uh, we used to go to the UN negotiations uh, all around the world. Um, and that's a lot to talk about. But in 2017, when uh, Donald Trump announced the withdrawal of the US from the Paris Agreement, I was in Bonn with a delegation of 18 people and said, what are we doing here? We need to go back home. and try to understand why the United States is such a problem child in the uh, UN <laughs> negotiations. So a lot of the things I'll say about the difficulty that the UN negotiations have experienced are in substantial part due to the United States, and not just the United States, but in great part as the wealthiest country in the world uh, with the most capacity to act. So, you know, environment. environmental and climate governance goes back to 1972, really, in Stockholm, uh, conference and then in 1992 in the Rio de Janeiro Earth Summit when the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was negotiated and agreed. 195 countries, literally the whole world, agreed to avoid dangerous climate change and that countries would act according to principles of equity and that countries would act uh, and the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities that is and respective capabilities. That is, the wealthy countries would go first and do the most and help the poor countries act. And uh, so I've done a lot of work on this since uh, starting to work on climate change back in 93. And um, really the, uh, the core dilemma that I lo looked at was the, this tension between the global north and the south. Because uh, really the promises made back then uh, were not kept. And the promises often continue to not be kept. For example, in important conferences in uh, Kyoto in 1997, in Copenhagen 2009, in Paris in 2015. So it's a, unfortunately a history that is very frustrating uh, for those of us who go to these things and care, and I, th I guess I would encourage people to care. It's a, a lot of possibility, but a lot of frustration. Um, as one young negotiator said, you've been negotiating my whole life. And, you know, and where are we? Uh, we're missing uh, really what the scientists say we need to do to avoid dangerous climate change, what we said we were going to do. Um, so the three pillars, of course, of the climate negotiations are mitigation, that is reducing emissions, and they're uh, 
you know, there are goals in the Paris Agreement, uh, which are temperature targets, but if you look at the actual pledges that have been made, they don't match up to the goals. So they're inadequate, and the policies that have been put in place in nations, if you add them all up, do not add up to meeting the Paris Agreement. And on the implementation, it's even worse. So that's the first pillar. Sorry I'm so depressing. I'm trying to be quick, and I only have five minutes. Um, the second is adaptation, right, that we would help developing countries deal with the impacts of climate change and prepare themselves for what was coming and what is now happening. Um, in, in that case, it's really about funding. Are the wealthy countries stepping up to the plate with enough funding? In, in the Copenhagen round, uh, Hillary Clinton uh, and, and be put into the negotiations the idea of $100 billion a year uh, pledge to be delivered by 2020, and that uh, uh, quite a lot of work in my lab was documenting that, along with there's a lot of other NGOs and others, and even the Standing Committee on Finance documenting that um, those pledges were not met. <clears throat> a lot of the aid was actually just rebranded or rebadged or relabeled um, to be called adaptation when they were just, it was development aid. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of un underfunded and missed promises there. The third pillar, which is, which is new, is loss and damage. That is, if you don't reduce emissions enough, then you have to adapt. If you can't adapt, then there's just the things that are damages. And this is a legal term being adopted in international climate governance to uh, essentially figure out how to help uh, with you know, cultural losses, people's countries who are going underwater or their sacred places or other impacts that just will not be repaired. So that's unfortunately really not a, it's not a new problem, but it's finally in the, you know, in the agreements. There's a fund established this year, which I know Alice is going to talk about. But this idea came, uh, was actually introduced in 1991 uh, by Vanuatu, uh, and included uh, really this, uh, this elements of a, of a loss and damage fund. It was called insurance at that time, I think. So the question is why, you know, why are we not uh, achieving what we need to? And I would say a lot of this that we've learned is that there's been obstruction right from the start. Back in the original negotiations in 1991, business organizations from the U.S. and other countries were there making sure that no binding agreements were ever agreed. Uh, and finding ones that would be um, sufficient to the, what the science told us. Um, so the questions are, as we look forward, uh, do we shut down the UN Framework Convention, start all over again? Um, I would say, you know, there is some benefit of it, even if it's just raising the issue of climate and getting leaders together and making them say something in public every year. Um, do we exclude fossil fuel rep representatives? You know, as uh, Alice is going to say, there's thousands that show up each year. Um, or at least hundreds. We don't know the exact number. But, you know, it's like having tobacco companies at the tobacco negotiations, you know, or the, the smoking agreements. Uh, do, well, at least what's happening is now they're supposed to identify themselves as being f from, you know, industries. So that's it's a weak start, but it's something. And then there's language that's been ad agreed, and I'm out of time, so I'm just going to pass it on to Alice to tell the rest of the story. But I. I say to everybody, don't give up. This is really important. We can do better, but I think we have to address this obstruction that happens mostly not at the negotiations, but mostly back at, at, uh, in home uh, national capitals. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I think that was just the perfect framing to, to get to, you know, make sense and ground us into understanding that it's kind of, you know, fried and we may want to cool it down, and if we want to cool it down, we'd better act fast. Um, so just a reminder of that goal of the Paris Agreement, the main goal is to limit global warming to what we call 2 degrees, and if possible, 1.5 degrees, above what we call the pre-industrial levels, and to agree on a deal to share the costs, right, as, as Tim has just explained. This is where we were heading to before the Paris Agreement plus three degrees Celsius, which is more or less six Fahrenheit. Think about it as the Earth as your own human body. What kind of fever is that? It's more of a stroke and you're dead, right? Well, it's pretty much the same for the planet. 
These are just a few examples of what the world would look like if we had not put in place multilateral governance to try our best to address this, right? This is Dubai today, and this is Dubai with three degrees of global warming where we had COP28 um, in December. That's just the sea level rise, right? No other of the climate impacts. Okay, this is just like to remind you, like those costs are, are you know, numbers. You can make whatever you want with them, but that gives you a sense of what um, that could mean for world economy. So COP28 is what I would frame as the oil and gas COP. And this is a picture taken by Priyanka in the green zone. And you can see this um, greening the aviation, which you could frame as greenwashing um, the aviation because uh, it's not about putting flowers on a plane. It's about rethinking why do we even need planes? And if we do, how do we build them? How do we sustain them? How do we fuel them? in a way that would be truly decarbonized, right? Um, there were varying perceptions of the outcome of this COP. Uh, the first quote is from Sultan al Jaber, who was uh, the UAE COP28 president, and he's also the CEO of ADNOC, which is the oil and gas company of um, the UAE. And in his closing speech, he uh, concluded that by following our North Star, we have found that path we should be proud of our historic achievement, which I think is true. And what is also true is the closing statement from Anne Rasmussen, who was the chair of the Alliance of the Small Island States, the most vulnerable nations on the planet, at risk of being themselves the loss and damage, seeing their own territory disappear, being for some of them already digitalized in preparation to remember for what was once their land. And Anne Rasmus had said, we have made an incremental advancement over business as usual when what we really needed is an exponential step change. Simon Steele, he's also uh, originally from one of those uh, small island states, currently the UNFCCC executive secretary in his closing speech mentioned that whilst we did not turn the page on the fossil fuel era in Dubai, this outcome is the beginning of the end for the fossil fuels, not from the planet. Um, so what was there at COP28? It was what we call the global shock take, that moment of like reckoning with where we are now and what have we done. And uh, on each of the elements uh, that were mentioned by Timmins, um, we're failing, right? Global average temperature should be well below two degrees and increase efforts to remain below 1.5 if possible. Well, 2023 was the hottest year on record ever. The current average is already 1.2, even 1.5 already if you take into account La Nina. Uh, and projections expect that we will cross that 1.5 limit around 2030, which is literally tomorrow. Under, unless drastic systemic global reductions happen now. On ad adaptation, this is a quote from the IPCC report, 3.6 billion people already live in contexts that are highly vulnerable to climate change. On finance, not only are we failing on the 100 billion <coughs> promise to developing countries, but we currently have 7 trillion US dollars of public money, right, our own taxes, that goes into fossil fuel subsidies. This is a quote from the IMF. Um, so there's one thing. Fossil fuels must substantially decline to remain below 1.5. How do we do that? Well, Sultan al-Jabir was, you know, everything you can project on what he is and who he is, did manage to revive that sense that it is possible to get to 1.5, where most of us, everywhere in the world, had already taken it for granted that we would never make it, right? Um, how to get there? Well, there was a, a paper, I think, in Nature or Science uh, recently <coughs> that tried to calculate what would that mean. Well, what would that mean is by 2050, we would need to decline our uh, burning of coal 
by 95%, that is almost like complete ending of any use of coal, 70% of our use of oil, and oil is everywhere, right? Including in that very place. Everything in plastic is oil. Everything in our life is oil fuel or oil ba based. Uh, and 54% of decline of gas, what we call natural gas, which is in fact methane, an extremely potent greenhouse gas. And that is even if combined with the geo, you know, engineering solutions that some of them, some of us dream about. Um, so here is the COP decision. I'm not going to get in there. I, I'm happy to come back to this in the Q and A. Uh, conclusion is in the title. If we were to implement all of these, we could actually make it to 1.5. Like this, we computed this in, in um, calculation systems, and it's actually leading to 1.5 by the end of this century. The only problem is this is an optional list, is not quantified, and it's lacking responsibilities. And we have reasons to doubt the goodwill that was really in there, in that list. When we look at the presence of fossil fuel representatives in this COP, apart from the COP president himself, including the one for next year in Azerbaijan, who will also be an oil and gas CEO, uh, Brazil, who will be host to the COP30, announced that they were joining OPEC during COP28. What a, what a beautiful messaging, isn't it? Um, 2,456 fossil fuel lobbyists registered, not knowing how many more, including in my own delegation, the CEO of Total Energies was there as a member of the delegation, right? Um, this letter of OPEC was leaked um, mid-cup, and I think it shows how much good work was happening if they react this way. They alerted on undue and disproportionate pressure against fossil fuels may reach a tipping point with irreversible consequences for the oil industry, not for the planet, of course. Inviting all members to proactively reject any text or formula that targets energy, i.e. fossil fuels, um, rather than emissions. Vladimir Putin honored us with his visit to the UAE and Saudi Arabia, did not show up on COP28 site. He was actually dealing uh, oil and gas with his counterparts in the UAE and Saudi Arabia. There was, however, a real progress that happened. Let me check on my timing here, sorry. Um, yes, the loss and damage fund was finally achieved. And that was a major achieve diplomatic achievement because it was achieved on day one of the COP. This like never happens. Everyone is always waiting for the last minute to finally do something and keeping their bargaining chip all along. Here, the UAE managed, the COP presidency managed to get that done on day one at the opening of ceremony of the agenda adoption to create a loss and damage fund. Tricky question here, right? which is the question of responsibility and reparations. You can apply that same dilemma to many other issues, including in the US today, right? That notion of justice and what does it mean? It happened. There is no compulsory contribution. It's less than 1% of the estimated need. There is no contribution for any of the big ones but UAE as co-presidency and the EU tiny little um, symbolic contribution from the US, a couple millions, like 17 millions, uh, but still, is there. It, and, and, and as Tim said, 1991, how many years to get there? And my sense is we got there just because finally in the US and other developed countries, we're finally noticing that it's actually going to hit us as well. Global goal on adaptation, very hard to define because adaptation is local. It's about how do you handle these massive heat waves? How do you handle a flood? How do you handle the, the massive cyclones that are getting to you, right? Well, we managed to achieve a goal that was extremely specific, inviting everyone to really like start planning and taking into account what will this mean for your government? What will this mean to your country? What will this mean to your population? And how can you handle that? There was no progress in carbon market, which I see actually as a good thing. 
and climate finance needs, well, we're not there, clearly, and that's a problem. Um, yet, we were told that this was a historical success. And to a certain extent, it is. Um, we did happen to reach a consensus, which in the given geopolitical context that we all know, was clearly not a given, right? Um, people left the room when the previous presidency asked a minute of silence for Gaza. The Iranian delegation, uh, head of delegation left on day two because of the Israeli presence. Um, Russia asked to get rid of the Open Society Institute and not allow them to be here, right? And we made it. So multilateralism held. It's not good enough, but honestly, where we are now, I'll take that. Um, first time that cards were actually on the table, and so if you know them and can identify them, you can actually address them. Very wide participation. I'm not sure that's a good thing either, but well, that's something they claimed to be good. So success, what does it mean? And here I, I share with you a quote that Priyanka shared with me from the Fijian um, National uh, Pacific head of Greenpeace, Shiva Gunden. Where is the North Star? It's non-existent in this text. Empty words, political jargon, and compromise favor vested interests more than us. So what's to come? Next year, Baku, Azerbaijan, um, will be addressing the finance issue and follow up on those carbon mechanisms, carbon market mechanisms. The big thing is gonna be in Belém, Brazil. <coughs> um, Lula wants this to happen in the middle of the Amazonian rainforest <coughs> and delegate sleep on boats on the Amazonian river, which I think is crazy amazing. I'm not sure it's feasible, but what a beautiful way of making people understand and feel the need to preserve that forest, right? And this is when countries will be expected to submit their new NDCs, their national contributions to the collective effort that is needed. Um, and they will integrate, as you can see here, a uh, picture that I took at the, at the Brazilian Pavilion during COP28. Uh, this person here is going to be the lead negotiator for uh, Brazil. Um, an indigenous woman uh, will lead the charge, which I think is a beautiful symbol, but also a very important reminder that you cannot address climate without also addressing people and nature, or what we call biodiversity. So, yeah, I will stop here um, and leave it to Todd to give us his perspective. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, very glad to be here. <coughs> I, I do come at this issue from a somewhat different uh, perspective since uh, I was first pulled into climate change when I was working in the White House for President Clinton and doing other things, and I got involved then. And, Kind of never shook it off, um, and uh, and then went in with President Obama at the beginning of his administration, and was there all the way through, uh, almost till the end, but past Paris. Um, so I do come at it very much from a point of view of um, of what's politically possible uh, in any given moment. Um, politics, as you probably have heard by now, is the art of the possible, and diplomacy is kind of politics internationally. So. You're always working against that um, backdrop uh, if you're in the government. Um, look, if the question is, are we doing enough? Absolutely not. Clearly not. Uh, I think that uh, Dubai, Dubai was, I think, by many people not expected to do much. Um, I think it actually did do something that was important, and uh, Alice mentioned it. But um, the, the shockingly, the notion of fossil fuels, the, those two words put together, had never before been in any COP decision. Um, there was, in Glasgow in uh, 2021, for the first time, there was reference to coal. And so fossil fuels were not only mentioned, but were, uh, you know, there was language saying that, um, that uh, we should transition away from fossil fuels uh, so as to achieve net zero emissions uh, by 2050 in keeping with the science. That's a 
pretty good statement actually coming out of that uh, out of that cop. Um, it doesn't necessarily it, it doesn't do everything, but what we, what you do find in negotiations, if you're lucky, is that it, when you can't get all that you that you that you want to get, and you're trying to go up the mountain, you get a foothold, you get that far, and then you you hope to go further uh, in time. Uh, let me just pull back for a minute away from the specific negotiation um, and and sort of give you the way I look at this issue right now. Um, the science and the impacts of climate change are, are uh, telling us that things are moving faster and more, uh, they're sort of worse and faster than, than, than scientists thought uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, so that's point number one. Point number two, the, um, the, energy, uh, the energy transition, the, um, the uh, sort of progress in, in, in toward the world of clean energy is happening at an absolutely spectacularly good level. Um, the, uh, the, um, the progress uh, on, uh, of renewable energy, the progress of electric vehicles, and on and on is happening remarkably faster than what the major modelers said 10 or 15 years ago, the International Energy Agency and 20 others. It's gone way, way past that, much faster than, than anybody had ever uh, expected. So that's very good. Um, it is also true that, that, uh, that, that in this world, there are all sorts of obstacles to going as fast uh, in, that, in that transition. Uh, as we need to go, and, and those obstacles are, I think, m most prominently the fossil fuel industry, and then issues of, fo of, of political economy that, uh, that, that tie into that. And the political economy can be the, the power of, of uh, the coal industry in India. Uh, it, it can be the power of oil and gas uh, lobbyists in the United States. There's all, I mean, all over the world, there are different levels of political economy. Uh, if you could, if you could overcome that drag, if you could overcome the the uh, the resistance, the capacity that the world has in terms of uh, of our uh, innovative capacity, in terms of our capacity to afford what needs to happen, it's all there. It's all there, and it's again, it's been demonstrated, and 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 the 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 um, the level of of innovation going on now. Uh, in all sorts of uh, of uh, all sorts of facets of uh, of the clean energy world, again, is great. Um, so I, I would leave you with with one uh, thought. I, I think a lot of this, at some level, comes down to uh, to normative change. To um, to uh, the I mean, the, the one thing politicians listen to is when they see a movement so strong that they, that they will be in trouble if they ignore it. One of the most striking things there was a rhetoric of transformation that very much relied on corporate messaging of Exxon and of BP saying how they are going to transform the world. You could see outside the Dubai metro um, language that comes from this corporate world. Um, that was what had decorated Dubai for COP28 normally. And um, it's usually during these conferences, there's a huge civic society mobilization and there are a lot of protests happening outside. But there was very little actually none going on outside of Expo City, which was the venue of the conference itself. And inside the venue, there was a small space that was designated for activists to come in and, and stage their protests so that there was like that outlook, you know? Um, and so all of us social justice warriors were, were there talking about fossil fuel. And it very much was, you know, walls dividing where the real discussions take place versus where your frustrations can be expressed, which was the same as it was 10 years ago. And if that's how it's going to be 10 years from now, like, things won't change. Um, I did attend the G77 plus China meetings, which were very interesting because the whole notion of dividing the way the UN works and how we think about the world in terms of developed and developing, and well, I'm from a least developed country, so what does that even mean? Is like 
being in those spaces, we really ask the question, like, are people being represented for the way we think of the notion of these countries? Or when the model of growth around which every country needs to progress is still one where we must rely on growing our energy consumption, growing, like, how much reserves countries can expand, then what are the kinds of interests that dominate? And very much in these spaces, the interests that were dominating were ones that wanted to seep in natural gas as clean energy as well and like the tiniest words getting debated over for hours which you know looks frustrating but that's at the end of the day what COP is all about um, but the last thing I want to leave you with that was the most impactful for me was that I did join the Nepali delegation and was following their work a very male delegation and yet one that I got to learn a lot from but in a very wide conference space, the only other Nepali people that I saw at this conference were the janitors, the cleaners, the security guards that are standing outside in the $100 heat of Dubai. And that's when I realized that is the global south and that is the real representation of people that are actually never going to know what's even happening within these rooms. Um, and every time I spoke to someone, they'd be like, huh, like, how are you on the other side? How are with those people? And it's very shocking because the reason I joined the climate movement is one where I care a lot about structural inequalities. But when we are in these spaces, they very much reverberate the kind of structural inequalities that our world already exists in, because of which the people running a conference like COP are the thankless laborers that are most representative of the country I come from as opposed to the kind of positions we're put in to represent ourselves inside those rooms. So we're gonna open now for questions. Um, we wanted to reserve enough time for all of you to share thoughts, um, ask more, demand. <laughs> Please, um, Ali has the mic. Please speak in the mic because this is being live streamed and recorded. And um, having been in the audience trying to follow those, um, it's impossible to hear if people don't speak in the mic. So please speak in the mic. Sorry. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for this lovely talk. Um, I have a question for Priyanka specifically. Um, you mentioned that you attended a lot of the G77 plus China meetings. And I was wondering um, how, how you felt, like how, how, in what way were, was, I mean, G77, that's a lot of countries. Like how, to what extent, I mean, we pull, like pull it all together into like the global South, but like, I mean, that doesn't really mean anything at all, considering that there's so many countries with like different economies, with different social, with different political structures. So like, in what way do you think, like what were the points where you, that you could surround, like that you could come together on? And what were the biggest points of contention and like in this meeting room? I think one thing that very much shocked me in there was, a, the rhetoric of we want to continue developing fossil fuel reserves was not coming from the traditional players you would expect it coming from. It was coming from places like Nigeria or other African nations which have recently discovered new oil reserves. And I think that was as shocking as that was for me. I think that very much made me realize the the kind of context under which the climate crisis and trying to solve it operates, which is still a growth paradigm. Um, another one, and this very much is just the dynamics of how things work, and that's what I got to observe, is this huddle formation um, that Alice was explaining to me about as well, which is where you know any informal discourse takes place in the form of like tiny huddles that start forming around like the person at the center that's kind of leading what language is going to be written in that particular amendment. And so the further out you are, the harder it is for you to put your voice in there. And so that's a very real manifestation as well of, of how that exclusion completely occurs within the meeting room. <coughs> question is for Alice Plain. You meant you touched on the increased uh, involvement of youth and just the general expansion of participation in COP. 
Uh, so what are your... I've heard some people say this is a good thing, and so many people say it's not such a good thing. So what are your thoughts on the pros and cons of that? Yeah, thank you. And I didn't catch your name. Alexa. Thank you, Alexa. Um, one of my colleagues, when I was in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, was in charge of what we call global climate action support, which is basically everything beyond government representatives. In a COP, you have a blue zone, which is the official place where government representatives come, and the green zone, which is where private sector, any more like citizens, of regardless their capacity, can go and like see the showcasing of innovation, have discussions and whatnot. So you have to distinguish those two areas. She would work more mainly on the green area, the global climate action, and she would call this um, the sausage fest. <laughs> I think that tells it all. Um, beyond that, um, I think the numbers do not equate to actual inclusion. And I think what Priyanka has just shared is a demonstration of that. And so as much as it's great to have lots of participants and have this open to anyone and whatnot, I would actually prefer smaller settings with more qualitative discussions and a true engagement with the content of everyone's expectations. You have 100,000 people in a room. Good luck being heard. Right? So I guess that's, that's how I see it. Um, and although there's been some uh, critique of the previous um, year where people had not been able to access the site, it's logistically a hell, a nightmare to organize these things. And, and the UAE was um, building on their uh, 2020 Expo site, which is a beautiful place. It's the best organized COP I've ever attended. Never seen such, such a good organization, right? But to the points I've just explained, I think that's not good enough to have numbers. Thank you. Thank you. I would address this to the panel uh, at large. <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago, uh, Rex Tillerson, the head of Exxon, was quoted in the New York Times as saying that Exxon is and always will be a molecule company, never an electron company, by which he meant that they will always be dealing with petroleum, never with uh, developing electricity from passive sources. Uh, given a statement like that, it, it's just mind-blowing uh, to me, just a regular person, to learn uh, that this important uh, organ, you know, series of meetings is headed by oil executives. I also read that this was um, a strategy of John Kerry's. Um, I was wondering what you thought of that, whether it's effective or a mistake. Um, could I jump on that for a second? <laughs> um, you heard that what is the strategy of John Kerry's, to hold, to hold the cop in, in Dubai? No, to have, had, to have had the host of it be an oil executive. No, I, I'm... I'm sure that that's not right. I mean, John Kerry is uh, is about as committed a uh, a person from the U.S. government, starting for many years in the Senate on climate change, as you could find. I think that Kerry. I mean, I I wasn't talking to him about this stuff, but I but from uh, my observation from uh, from a short distance is that Kerry was definitely trying to get something out of the oil industry in as much as this was a cop in, in, in Dubai, but not that he organized or that that was a grand strategy. Um, and there were, again, I'm, I'm with you about Exxon and molecules and all of that. I don't have any, in, any, any different uh, position, but, um, but again, the language that we already talked about on fossil fuels is better than anything that's ever happened before. And there were a couple of things that the industry pledged to, um, which is extremely easy to be cynical about. And I mean, I roll my eyes also because they, they, they are, they are uh, making, making those, taking those positive steps as a way to make sure that they don't have to move in their main business, for sure. On the other hand, 
if they actually, I don't remember the exact percentages are now, but it, but if they actually cut the uh, cut emissions from their own processes, from their own you know their own work, that's different from the oil that they sell to make cars go and everything else. But within their own, they, if, if they if they cut it to the to the extent that they said that they're going to, and if they cut methane t t to the extent that they say they're going to, really important actually. I mean methane is I mean, really big cuts to methane are the best chance we have to buy more time because methane doesn't last long in the atmosphere, like 20 years, but there's a huge amount of it up there and it has something like, I don't know, so either somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of the warming so far in the atmosphere right now is caused by methane. So those are important steps. My guess is that Kerry wanted to get what could be gotten but not that he thought it was a great idea to have. Uh, yeah, if I can jump in on that one. Thanks, thanks a lot for like <laughs> replacing the frame here. I would say that Kerry historically has been a green growth advocate. And so that is in that mind frame that he indeed has advocated for companies to be involved in the action and mobilized in some kind of like environmental or climate responsibility towards us and the planet, right? Um, I think it's a bit dismissive to say that he would have, you know, made this happen. This is like kind of ignoring the fact that in the UN every year there's a rotation between country and this year was the turn of an Arab country. And uh, please cite me one Arab country that is not oil and gas. Um, and, and I'm happy to take it, right? <coughs> but this is, and it's their responsibility to decide who's going to lead within that group, right? So it makes sense that it was an oil country. And by the way, we're the one consuming that oil and, and, and begging for lower prices. So let's also not forget our own responsibility in their um, production, right? The U.S. has been preserving their own reserves for strategic reason that make a lot of sense. But let's not pretend that it's as if we were better than anyone. Um, and sorry if I'm, if I'm being a bit harsh here, uh, but that's how I feel. I'm not, I'm not putting this on you. Um, and then the last thing I would say is that there was actually value in having a COP uh, president that was an oil executive because he was able to speak the language of those CEOs. Um, I listened to him six months before COP. He came to Houston and he gave this talk to the annual meeting of the oil and gas industry. And his first sentence was, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> Hello. Um, I wanted to ask any of you to elaborate a bit on enforcement and your hope or lack of hope um, for the potential of this type of international agreement to have some sort of binding power in the future. Um, I'm a student in Priyanka's year of environmental studies and have been really disheartened by everything I've learned about the international bargaining process and have come to the opinion that it's <clears throat> action is going to happen on the hyper local and local scale if it's going to happen at all um, but I don't want to believe that and have you know respect and recognition for the importance of the international process so I would just like to hear how you hope or envision that this process might evolve to to have some real enforcement measures maybe economically that's the only process I'm aware of as of now um, I, I'll get us started because I think you're on the most important part here that we've had a first a non-binding agreement and then it was just I mean th that was the UNFCCC and then the Kyoto Protocol was just a you know just the OECD the wealthiest wealthy countries I think 27 countries and they were just you know like five percent emission reductions um, by when was it, uh, do you know, or does anybody know, 20, by 2000 or something? For, for, for Kyoto. For Kyoto, no, the, the Kyoto, the first the period was 2008 to 2012. Yeah, right, 2010. Yeah. Um, thanks. Uh, but I think having, by, but the, even if you didn't meet your target, it, it just meant there was, there was not really strong enforcement mechanism in it. Todd can correct me or somebody can correct me, but I think this is a big problem, and the Paris Agreement, I mean, there was sort of the switch in Copenhagen 
to a more bottom-up, what they called pledge and review system. That is, countries were given the choice to make their own pledges, and then the other countries were supposed to review it, and uh, a, a system which I think is uh, a recipe for, for in inadequate outcomes. So, um, but, you know, there was hope that countries, by being given the choice to do what they felt comfortable pledging, might actually come through. Uh, I, anyway, I think justice and fairness are how people, people want to know that other, others in their situation are acting in the way that they need to, doing their fair share. And we have not had a system based on fair shares really since the, since the beginning. And I think if, if there was a fair share system, obviously I'm a top-down system approach person, but it's, it's been off the table. Um, so I wish I was more optimistic about it, but I think you have identified the <laughs> core problem. Could, could I make a comment? Um, so a couple things. Uh, I think, again, to me, fair share is a great idea with the one exception that it's impossible to negotiate, right? Because it, it's, it's burden sharing is the idea. And you can't, you, you can't negotiate it. An important thing to know is that the climate negotiations operate essentially on what's called a consensus basis. So if you have out of your 195 or 200 countries, if you have five who say no, the answer is no. So that's what you're always, you're always working against that kind of crazy um, uh, system, uh, um, rule. Um, with respect to enforcement and binding power, um, you have, so you have one problem with respect to, to uh, some aspects of bindingness. But Paris is binding in a number of ways. It's not binding with respect to the targets themselves. And the biggest reason why they're not is the United States. And the reason why, why that's the case in the United States is there's not a chance in hell that you could ever get an agreement like that uh, approved in the Senate where two-thirds, the Constitution requires two-thirds approval. So we very carefully negotiated an agreement with as much binding as could be done, but the kind of binding that doesn't require going to the Senate. So that's, I mean, that's just a reality. And, and you, you might not like the reality, but, but you either live with it and try to work with it or, or not. Even in, in, in cases where there are binding agreements, the actual international enforcement is a separate issue. So, um, so even even if you you know waved a wand and said, okay, the U.S. can can do binding targets, the notion that that failing to meet them um, results in penalties, I think it happens in some agreements, but it's very difficult to to get that done. Again, I come back to the notion that I think um, you you need to have the kind of normative change that leads countries to not want to look like they're failing. And to and to and to get have um, difficulty with their own publics, with international reputation and uh, and the like, and like those things do matter. I you know if you just one last comment in in the original framework convention uh, included a non-binding provision saying that developed countries should try to take their emissions back to 1990 levels by the year 2000. People didn't pay much attention to that at all. I mean, it was. It, I mean, I was in, in the Clinton administration. That really wasn't a focus. If you, if you go forward to uh, to um, when Obama was there and, and Copenhagen, and there was a first set of of Copenhagen targets, not binding. The 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 administration was completely including uh, including Obama busting our ass to meet the target, even though it's not enforceable because. The, the background had changed, the importance of it had changed, and I think that, you know, we need to build more and more of that. It would be great if it could be different, but that's the reality, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I think uh, kind of the expectation that we all have is there is some kind of authority in the room that's going to tell us what to do. Some of them, some of us expect this from God, some of us expect this from our leaders, some of us expected from the professors in the room. Um, but the problem, that's to me the main problem of climate change, right? This predicament, it's about everything, it's about everyone, it's about every moment and it's about everywhere. So it's about all of us in this room today and beyond. Um, 
and, 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 and there's this tendency to kind of play the blame game and to focus on the critique. I think this is valid, this is relevant, but to me what we truly need today is to start and, and, and dream and allow ourselves to begin to think what else could be possible? How, how could we build on actual collective action, actual collective building of that, that world that we would want to live in? And, and we, we tend to forget this because we expect those others, those so-called leaders, to tell us what to do. Um, so just because it's the end of um, timing here, this is actually something that we're trying to do, this dreaming, um, with a few students here from um, this university, including Priyanka, Fanny, and Atarv here in the room today. And um, we're hoping that you can help us dream and join this conference that we will be hosting on April 12th, 13th, and 14th, where we will do a simulation, just a game, where we would assign brown affiliates to 28 different kind of delegations, including more than human ones, giving them a voice through representation and allowing ourselves to dream. W would that yield something different if we were to take those others, non-states, other humans, and other more than human natural elements into account? So this is my invitation as a closing to this talk to come and dream with us. Thank you.